Uh, is it Mueller? Or... Yeah, I'm recording. Oh, hey, I'm Mueller. Are you Mueller? Are you also like letting people in the waiting room? Yep, I will be in charge of that. couple things. I just wanted to quickly thank our sponsors, which I often forget to do. And those are the Center for Russian, East European and Eurasian Studies, and also the Center for um, European Studies here at UT Austin, in addition to the Department of History and the Institute for Historical Studies. Um, in addition to that, I just wanted to repeat, <clears throat> and most weeks we try and say this, if we can remember, and I'm going to post it in the chat, that our center condemns the Russian Federation's military invasion of Ukraine, and we stand in support of the people of Ukraine who are fighting for their lives and sovereignty in the face of this unjustified invasion of Russian military forces. Just our hearts are with Ukraine, and so we like to just bring that up at the beginning of our, our various gatherings. Um, so today we're going to um, shift away from Ukraine, although we're actually quite close geographically, <laughs> um, looking at the region of Dobruja. Um, let me first introduce myself, Kirill will introduce himself, and then we can introduce our speaker. I'm Dr. Mary Neuberger. I am a professor of history here at UT Austin, although right now I'm coming to you from West Texas. Uh, I'm also the director of the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies. Kirill? Thank you very much. I'm uh, honored to have such a co-host. My name is Kirill Abramov. I'm an assistant professor uh, here at the Department of Slavic and Eurasian Studies at UT Austin, and I'm also a director of the Global Disinformation Lab, which is housed in the same center and department. Uh, and I'm uh, truly thrilled that it's Friday again. Uh, we do have yet another Balkan Circle, a tradition that carries it into its third year. And uh, we have fantastic speaker today uh, on topics which we are all very interested. Uh, and I would uh, ask my co-host to officially um, you know, make the introduction for the speaker today as the topic is really exciting. Mary? Yes, yeah, so it's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Catalina Hunt, who received her PhD from Ohio State University in 2015. Her current book project is entitled Identity Change in Ottoman Borderlands, the Muslims of Dobruja, 1839 through 1914. And this book project examines the transi transition of Romanian Muslims from imperial subjects to nation state citizens from the beginning of the Ottoman reform era 1839 to the advent of World War I in 1914. Dr. Hunt is the author of a book in Romanian on the status of non-Muslim communities living in Islamic territories during the classic age of Islam, which came out in 20, 2003, as well as several articles, book chapters, and book reviews in peer-reviewed publications in the US and Europe. She is currently a visiting assistant professor in history at Kenyon College, where she teaches courses on modern Europe, East European history, the Muslim experience in Europe, and borders and identities in Europe and the Middle East. Her talk today is entitled Ottoman Borderlands, Islamic Modernism, and the Making of Muslim Identities in 19th Century Dobruja. Take it away, Catalina. <laughs> Thank you so much for your uh, kind introduction and for your invitation to be part of this amazing series. Um, so I'm grateful to, to Professor Sneuberger and Avramov and um, also Cara and Molly who accommodated me. Uh, today's presentation indeed relies on material from my current book project, which is based on my PhD dissertation. Uh, inspired by Cooper and Brubaker's influential definition of the term identity in this work, I analyzed the ways in which the Muslims of this borderland region incorporated into the Ottoman Empire in the 15th century and annexed to Romania in 1878, presented themselves in the public sphere as modern citizens with strong state lo loyalties in an attempt to carve a better place for themselves in society. I also conceive borderlands in the vein of Ara William Zartman as both spaces and social processes, sheltering communities that live different lives and embrace different identities than those from the center of power, with power understood in the civilizational as well as the political and economic sense. 
So I brought with me a PowerPoint presentation and a paper to keep me organized. So you have seen here um, the, the, the title slide uh, uh, depicts this uh, amazing map that I have found in Bashbak al Archiv in, in Istanbul, the Ottoman archives. It's a 19th century map depicting the region of Dobruja uh, neighboring the Black Sea. And this is an outline of my presentation. After a brief presentation of this book project, I will um, go ahead and discuss the influence of Islamic modernism and re reformism, uh, 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 the reform era on the making of Muslim identities in 19th century Dobruja. Uh, and when I say Dobruja, I refer to Romanian Dobruja and not Bulgarian Dobruja. Uh, I will give a brief background on Dobruja and its Muslim population, followed by a discussion of the Crimean Jadidis and the Young Turks who influenced local Muslims um, and shaped their Muslim identities in uh, various ways. So I will look at their education, press, reading rooms, cultural associations, uh, how these outsiders who gradually became insiders assisted Muslim uh, migrants to the Ottoman Empire, and then I will discuss um, something that uh, has been recommended to me by historian Isa Blumi, the Proxima dynamic in Ottoman context, uh, trying to link some of the representatives of this Islamic modernism and reform to the local Muslims and also to Romania's concerns of reaching uh, Balkan uh, populations uh, in its efforts to create a greater uh, Romania. Uh, in the 19th century and also early 20th century. So as Professor uh, Neuberger said, my book project examines the shift of the Bujas Muslim population from Ottoman subjects to Romanian citizens in the modern period. Uh, based on archival, literary, and visual historical evidence in Ottoman Turkish, Romanian, French, and English, I argue that this important historical moment of transition exposed local Muslims to ideas of modernity that shaped their understanding of the world and their place within it, as well as triggered their cultural and political advancement. Ideas of modernity first reached them in the 19th century through Ottoman and Romanian policies, which transformed their living conditions and brought a heightened sense of belonging and political engagement with their states. But the state was naturally not the only agent of modernization. This period also witnessed the engagement of local Muslims with transnational networks from the broader Islamic law already mentioned, the Crimean Jadidis and the Young Turks. As I argue in this paper and in my book manuscript, it was the representatives of such networks and the new generation of Muslim elites they had molded locally, the teachers, the judges, the lawyers, the writers, the journalists, that set off the movement for cultural reform and political mobilization among Dobruja's Muslims. Defined not only by superior education status and influence in society, but also by the vigor and the perseverance with which they undertook the task of modernizing local Muslims, both in the private and public realms of life, this elite had a prominent role in the local production of knowledge and culture, helping local Muslims to negotiate a place in both Romania after 1878 and the Islamic world during an era of modernization, but also of war nationalism and border reconfiguration. To claim modernity, they incorporated into their lives ideas and behaviors of the modern individual who was more sophisticated and mannered, better educated and informed, and most certainly more connected and politically engaged, both inside and outside the boundaries of their states. They tried, not without facing opposition, to instill such values in local Muslims in a manner resembling that of other individuals across the Islamic world. In that, they were no different from their peers in Imperial Russia, British India, Ottoman Syria, Habsburg Bosnia, and independent Bulgaria. In all these cases, Muslim elites, both local and political exiles, were essential in creating the dominant form of local culture, social institutions, and political trends. 
because the Muslims of Dobruja's modernization occurred particularly under the impact of the Young Turks who operated in exile against Sultan Abdul Hamid II until 1908. I also make a case for the significance of the exiled refugee experience in the context of the empire to nation transition. Historian Issa Blumi's concept of the proximal um, dynamic in the Ottoman context proposed in his 2013 book on Ottoman refugees is relevant here. The Proxima dynamic defined a set of conditions enjoyed by Ottoman actors with both an intimate knowledge of Ottoman domestic concerns and an ability to function outside the formal capacity of the Ottoman state to dictate the parameters of action. Since Romania became a hotbed for the political activity of a sizable diaspora of Vlachs or Aromanians and Tusk Southern Albanians, it is crucial to assess the links between their activity and that of the leaders of the Young Turks operating from the Dobruja with the goal of overthrowing the regime in Istanbul. The Romanian government used this diaspora with the twin objective of extending its influence into contested Balkan territories and assimilate its minority groups, especially the sizable community of Muslims it acquired via the Treaty of Berlin. I suggest thus a nexus between accommodation and resistance to the new world order involving an emergent local Muslim elite of reforming stock simultaneously insiders and outsiders whose demands for change represented a form of resistance to traditional ways of community and state life, which in their view, impeded integration into a society in which they represented the ethno-cultural and religious other after 1878. In examining this topic, I place this case within the broader framework of Islamic modernity, a transnational phenomenon that engulfed not only Balkan Muslims, but also those living in the Middle East, Asia, and North Africa, arguing that Dobrujan Muslims ought to be integrated into scholarly debates on Islam, modernity, and identity formation. Dobruja's Muslims reacted to the modernizing pressure of Western Europe and war as such as engaged in contemporary debates on Islam and modernity as much as their Bosnian and Bulgarian peers, analyzed by historians Leila Amzi Erdodula and Milena Metodieva. Both Ottoman scholars wrote about the vibrant intellectual life that characterized the two respective communities whose representatives shaped the broader Muslim modernist discourse while steering local Muslims into a more cohesive communal life, as Metodieva put it. Modernity for them meant first and foremost a cultural transformation. And this is the reason for which in my work, I adopt Marshall Hodgson's understanding of modernity as not only rational emancipation from custom, or the further in unfolding of a bent for progress peculiar to the Western tradition, but also as a cultural transformation sui generis. And these are the two scholars that I mentioned, Leila and, and uh, Milena, who are doing just a fantastic work on uh, Balkan Muslims. Uh, before delving into my analysis, I would like to provide a brief background on this community and the region it inhabited during both Ottoman and Romanian periods so that I can place today's talk in its proper context. And I brought here yet another Ottoman map that I have discovered in uh, Bashbal Kalagarshiv in Istanbul and uh, a map from the internet to just show you the broader con geographic con context of the region. Nestled between the Lower Danube River and the Black Sea, Dobruja was the quintessential northern borderland of the Ottoman Empire. As you look at the map, you can see that it was a crossroads for movement by land and by water. It was also one of the empire's bread baskets, a critical part of the Ottoman defensive border against Imperial Russia especially, and often a battlefield. Slightly larger in size than the state of Connecticut and amounting to slightly over 200,000 people in 1876, this region had a Muslim majority made of ethnic Tatars and Turks, 
which it acquired in the aftermath of the Crimean War. Whereas the Tatar label applied to both Nogai and Crimean Tatar refugees, the Turk label, label referred to Turkish speaking Muslim migrants to the region over the centuries. Few remember today that the migration to and settlement in Dobruja of the Seljuk Turks, led by Saras Altuk Baba in the 13th century, marked the establishment of the first Muslim foothold in southeastern Europe. His presumed tomb is still a site of uh, pilgrimage today in the city of Baba Daru in Romanian Dobruja, as this picture uh, shows. Um, uh, these pictures show uh, pictures that I took during my research trip to that area in 2017. In the 19th century, the Muslims were unequally distributed in the region. Ethnic Turks lived concentrated on the Black Sea coast and in the south, whereas ethnic Tatars lived in its central and northern areas. Overwhelmingly rural, about 85% of them, uh, th this population worked the land and raised cattle, sheep, and horses. The urbanites, about 15% of, of them, included bureaucrats, lawyers, teachers, judges, journalists, uh, police and army employees, businessmen, craftsmen, traders, and others. They lived along an ethnically mixed population comprised of no less than 12 ethnic groups, according to the Ottoman survey penned by the land expert Ion Ionescu de la Brad in 1850, who also produced this fantastic map. And I regret that it is so tiny and you can't really look at details, but you will be astonished to see the representatives of all these 12 ethnic groups there. So um, Turks and Tatars lived along groups of ethnic Romanians, Bulgarians, Albanians, Greeks, Italians, Jews, Lipovans, uh, Russians, uh, Germans, and even more. Even in, if in 1876, according to French and British consular reports, they made up to 56% of the Bujas Muslims, or about 126,000 people out of a total of 225,000. In 1913, according to the official Romanian census, they only made up slightly below 11%. The difference represented the Muslims who emigrated to the Ottoman Empire during the Russo-Ottoman War of 1877-78 and, and after Dobruja's annexation to Romania in 1878. I know how controversial ethnographic maps are, and especially for the Balkan uh, region, but I brought here two maps that were based on the research of, of a uh, famous uh, French um, ethnographer of the 19th century, uh, recluse uh, who traveled to the area and surveyed it. Um, and this, these maps were um, reproduced in the beginning of the 20th century by a Romanian student uh, in Paris who was working on a PhD on the ethnographic composition of Dobruja. So as you look at these maps, uh, of course that uh, there are biases in there, but you see on the left uh, an overwhelming Muslim population depicted in orange and uh, pink. Uh, the orange one represented the Tatars, the pink one, the, the, the Turk, uh, the Turkish element. And then in 1913, you see a, a drastic drop in their numbers because of this enormous migration that occurred, especially after 1878, uh, when Romania incorporated the, the province of uh, Dobruja, most of it, because another part went to Bulgaria. So this, in this context, um, many millions of people have been displaced and this, um, this map, <laughs> complex map here, just shows that this was a process that was part of a much, much larger process of forced displacement that involved about 5 million um, Muslims and about 2 million Christians between the 18th and uh, early 20th century. So the Bruges Muslims were part of that. Now let us uh, return to the Islamic modernist and uh, reformist uh, networks mentioned in the title of this talk. 
um, their transformative work among the Muslims of Dobruja have been uh, would would have been uh, extremely difficult, if not impossible, without the foundation laid by the modernizing reforms of the 19th century Ottoman Empire and Romanian nation state. Ottoman reforms, known collectively as, as the Tanzimat, offered Muslims and all other Dobrujan inhabitants a better education, infrastructure, health care, and urban development, especially during the tenure of Midhat Pasha, the governor of the Danube province, between 1864-1868, a province that included what we now call Romanian Dobruja or the Tulcea Sanjak. Uh, railway tracks, street lighting, neighborhood gentrification, vaccination against smallpox, modern schools along with new telegraph lines, bridges and roads marked Dobruja as a modern space in Ottoman Balkans, and it was not the only one at that time. But despite such exciting progress, the introduction of the modern press remained a thing of the future. The Muslims did not acquire at that time their own newspapers or publications like their Bosnian and Bulgarian coalitions who enjoyed many such resources. This work was to be done much later in the 1890s by the reformist Young Turk movement during Romanian administration. Until then, we learned about their experience from the pages of the first official provincial newspaper in the Ottoman Empire, Tuna or Danube, which was published in Ruse or Rusuk in Ottoman, Turkish and Bulgarian between 1865 and 1877. Um, the Romanian administration of Dobruja did not impede the modern development of the local Muslims in major ways. Anyway, not in the ways in which the Bulgarian government gradually has, uh, has done it after uh, after in the acquiring independence. Um, it instead encouraged it like Habsburg um, Bosnia did or the, the, the Habsburg regime in, in, uh, in Bosnia. Um, it encouraged it as long as it benefited the state. The Romanian state carried over Ottoman uh, practices and regulations at the same time as it allowed local Muslims to fall under the modernizing influence of Islamic transnational networks known for their promotion um, of compliance with Romanian rules. Such an influence occurred, however, in the context of a Muslim population in demographic decline, as I have shown, a phenomenon emerging in response to Romanian official policies of regional colonization with ethnic Romanians and cultural homogenization. These measures resulted in the subordination of Islam to Romanian uh, regulations, systematic land confiscation, and a nearly negligible Muslim presence in Romanian structure, structures of power. The declining fortunes of the Muslims of Dobruja raised important questions about their survival after 1878. The answer was swiftly offered by the Crimean Jadidis and the Young Turks active in the Balkans. Survival, they argued, was doable if local Muslims used to their advantage the freedoms offered them by the Romanian government to both preserve and enhance their unique communal features educating themselves, producing and spreading culture locally and working tirelessly on combating backwardness and supporting progress in their neighborhoods would help them not only survive, but also prosper under Romanian rule. In promoting such message, these outsiders integrated the Islamic modernist discourse from the broader Islamic world into the local Muslim community, shaping its identity in the process. This was an identity, though, that was rationalized with references to both the Islamic heritage of local Muslims and loyalty to the Romanian state. The Crimean Jadidi movement emerged in Tsarist rule in Inner Asia during the 19th century as the product of a Muslim intellectual middle class attempting to modernize the local Muslim society in the context of Russian rule. Its ideological architect, Ismail Gasprale, also known as Gasprinsky, who lived between 1851 and 1914, argued that Muslims should borrow ideas from the more technologically advanced West to revitalize their intellectual and social life. They should do so, however, without losing sight of their Islamic identity. 
these ideas, as well as his acceptance of Russian rule and support for the unity of the world's Turkic population through common language, ideas, and actions, made him the most influential Crimean Tatar of his time, both in Imperial Russia and beyond, including in the Dobruja region. Kasparalu visited this region during the 1890s, reportedly, and again during the er early 1900s. His famous uh, newspaper, Terjuman, the interpreter, which occasionally discussed the condition of Dobruja's Muslim population, was widely read locally. This idea, his idea that education should rest at the core of Muslim advancement in society, being readily embraced by the emerging, emerging uh, local reformist youth, as seen in uh, um, uh, transformation of the school curriculum and cultural production that reflected such ideas. The emphasis that Gasparalo placed on the importance of preserving Islam in school curriculum for moral guidance only must have appealed to the more conservative section of the local Muslim community, most likely under the pressure of assimilation into the fabric of Romanian society and the irreversible incorporation of Islam into official Romanian structures. So they were forced to accept such a message in order to survive in the region. Gasparalu's influence found its highest expression in the work of famous poet Mehmet Niazi, who lived between 1878-1935. A Crimean Tatar born in Romanian Dobruja, Niazi was trained as a teacher in Istanbul, serving uh, upon uh, his graduation in teaching post in the Crimea and uh, the Dobruja. An active member of the Balkan branch of the Young Turks in his various capacities as activist, teacher, journalist, and poet, Niazi underscored the crucial importance of cultural modernization among the Muslims of Dobruja as, as much as he stressed attachment to Romania and love for the Romanian state. What made him a true icon for Crimean Muslims, however, was his advocacy of the idea that Dobrujan Tatars should first and foremost identify with their historic homeland, the Crimean Peninsula which he often mentioned in his work as Yeshil Ada, the Green Island. Although part of the wider Turkic world, Niazi argued, Tatars had their own identity based on a shared ethnicity, cultural heritage, and a common language. The many poems and articles in which he expressed such thoughts were printed and distributed widely, especially in the 20th century, when they served as resistance material against the assimilationist tendencies of communist Romania. The most influential agents of modernization among the region's Muslim population were by far the Young Turks. You see them depicted in this uh, 19th century Greek lithograph as lovers of freedom, equality, and fraternity. Um, but uh, this was uh, their, uh, their take on, on modernization and reform uh, in the beginning, at the beginning of their uh, historical trajectory. Uh, established in Istanbul in the late 1880s within the student body of the prestigious Royal Medical Academy, the Young Turk movement represented the modernist wing of the Ottoman intelligentsia and bureaucracy. Their ideology was originally scientific in the sense that science and the application of modern civilization through education was deemed as essential in the successful maintenance of a state. Like the Jadidis, the Young Turks viewed Muslim education along Western lines as critical for the progress of the society in which they lived. Although their anti-religious views stood in stark contrast with the idea that Islam should play an important role in society, which the fathers of Islamic modernism, Jamal al-Din al-Afghani and Muhammad Abdu embraced, the Young Turks showed consideration to Muslim traditions and faith forced by the circumstances in an attempt to maintain a following throughout the Islamic world, even incorporating Islam in their teachings to attract such a following. 
but it was not only education and cultural development that stood at the core of their modernist project. It was also the advocacy for a constitutional and parliamentarian system in Ottoman society. The young Turks vigorously opposed Sultan Abdul Hamid II from exile in places like the Dobruja and more broadly in the Balkans, as well as Western Europe and Egypt. As you see on this map, they had different uh, centers of resistance and um, activity. What united them initially was the goal to dethrone the Sultan, whose regime was deemed as abusive and obstructive. To their brethren, um, they, the Young Turks stressed the idea, uh, the, the need for cooperation with the states in which they resided uh, as a way to obtain protection and security for their political activities. Little they know then that uh, their work would not remain bound to politics alone. The Young Turks would fundamentally alter the Muslim communities within which they function as publishers, teachers, doctors, lawyers, writers, and political activists. They accomplished more than they had originally intended. At the outset, they wanted to spread anti-Hamidian ideas, but soon realized that the Muslims needed education to be able to understand and be receptive to their political agenda. In Dobruja, they dealt with concrete issues such as convincing the Romanian government to support Muslim confessional schools. And this was because Muslim parents refused to enroll children in Romanian schools for fear that they might be converted to Christianity. And this was fear that was shared by all Muslim parents who functioned under Christian governments. Uh, school administrators would uh, use uh, lofty mediators, such as the religious leaders of the community, the muftis, in an effort to attract the much needing funding. Influenced by the young Turks, most of these leaders would often invoke in their letters the obligation of the state to finance schools, to educate the next generation of Romanian citizens. One such let letter, which I have identified in uh, the National Archives, um, in Constanza, my native uh, city in, uh, in Dobruja. Uh, so one such uh, letter urged local officials to provide funds for hiring teachers at the Muslim school uh, of Constanza, one of the major urban areas of the region. The most, Mufti explained, quote, that because local Muslims have no other fatherland besides our Romanian country, and because they do not wish to have connections with any other country, AKA the Ottoman Empire, we believe, believe that it is our duty to have children raised in our traditional law as Muslims, but also as proud uh, Romanian citizens, end of quote. This letter is remarkable in so many ways uh, because the Mufti was an Ottoman official uh, appointed the post from Istanbul, not by Romanian authorities. Uh, he was, he had no knowledge of the Romanian language. He had no deep connection to the city where he acted as a religious leader. But he knew from the young Turks how sensitive Romanians were to national rhetoric, ultimately managing to secure the requested funds for confessional schools. There were also instances in which, although Romanian officials satisfied the demands of such local elite, they worked vigorously to separate their educational and religious ties with Istanbul. In 1880, the Muslim Madrasa of Baba Dao, whose members you see in this picture, later relocated to Mejidiye, was established with the main purpose of educating the teachers, hojas and religious leaders, imams, who would work within the Romanian educational and legal system. The students of this school studied Sharia law and Romanian jurisprudence, Arabic, Turkish, and Romanian language, as well as other subjects in the sciences and uh, humanities. And to further distance them from Istanbul, Romanian officials hired teachers from the Young Turk organizations, which opposed the Sultan and the Ottoman establishment. Their leader, Ibrahim Temo, uh, an Albanian Turk, who established in the 1880s the Committee for Union and Progress, 
the umbrella organization of the Young Turks was fully involved in this project. This is a picture that I have discovered in his private collection, which uh, now resides in the History Museum of Constanza. And I was deeply grateful to take a look at his collection and uh, read some of those documents and photograph some of those private pictures that have never been published before or seen before. Um, due to his political views, uh, Temo took refuge in Dobruja in the 1890s, where he became the leader of the Balkan Young Turks, gradually attaining the status of a distinguished local community leader whose collect collaboration with Romanian authorities materialized first in Romanian citizenship and then in a seat in the Romanian parliament. He also won over members of the local Muslim ulema and school teachers like Dervish Hima, Ahmed Zehbi, and Ali Shakir, as well as Ottoman diplomats like Shefik Bey, the Ottoman consul in Georgia, and uh, Alfred Rustem Bey, the secretary of the Ottoman legation in Bucharest. In his memoir, Stemo stated that he settled in Dobruja to spread young Turk ideas because Romanian authorities were known for sympathizing with anti-Ottoman movements, but soon realized that he was also there to serve the Brugian Muslims, both intellectually and medically. And serving well, he did, as you can see from this picture. Not only he, he did fix the eyes of the uh, community members, but also their teeth uh, goodness knows how, because he was just an ophthalmologist, um, but um, he, he managed to do this important medical work for the community, but also to spread young Turk ideas and contribute to uh, the growth of the Bruges Muslim intellectual elite at the Medrese of Medjidia. An outcome of the Romanian effort to accomplish its political aims while satisfying the demands of the local religious establishment, this medrese became an example of Muslim uh, modern education and a training ground for future loyal Muslim elites. And one way of instilling loyalty in them was to take Muslim students to meet the Romanian king of German origin, uh, Karl of Hohenzollern Singmaringen, at his impressive, beautiful summer residence in the Carpathian Mountains, uh, the Pelesh Castle. And one student recounted his experience in an exam paper of all places. So I'm going to quote this for you because it's just glorious. Um, I quote, a beautiful face, a noble head, a great appearance, an elegant figure, a majestic air that penetrates you, and above all, a sweet and attractive voice which wins you over from its first sound. This is the very impression His Majesty King Karl made on me when I had the fortune to be welcomed at the Palace Castle. I entered the palace with a trembling heart, and when I walked out of it, I felt as if I could have raised myself against the fastest train. This is how much thrill I had inside of me." End of quote. Although this source shows how impressionable this young man was, it also provided clues about the success of royal visits that aimed to bolster national pride and identity through connecting the Muslims with their king. And the same role in connecting Muslims with the king um, uh, had this, the construction of the, this beautiful Melike mosque in Constanza from royal purses in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, however, there was uh, so much tension between the young Turks in the Dobruja um, and uh, the Ottoman establishment. And this tension came especially from their publications, uh, which were the first ones that the Young Turks um, issued for the Muslim community. So they introduced the press in this space. Weekly newspapers like Sadakat, Sadaimilet, um, and Dobruja, uh, Dobroja uh, constituted the first Muslim press in, in the region, as I said. Published in Ottoman Turkish, each newspaper promised to illuminate the Muslim population through the sp spread of progressive ideas and to foster loyalty to the Romanian state. But the hidden ex expectation was that Muslims 
would develop in time a certain loyalty and attachment to the revolutionary cause of the Young Turks. Abdul Hamid II was frequently described in his press as the Red Sultan, a vampire or a snake that was injecting the body of the nation and his people with venom. The Sultan pressured Romanian officials uh, like he did in Bulgaria to close these newspapers and sometimes succeeded triggering angry protests among the members of the Paris branch of the Young Turks. One of the members of their newspaper, Meshpered Consultation, published an article titled The Sultan of Romania, which asked rhetorically whether Romanians were renewing their centuries long servitude to the empire under the men who deserved the least to possess any royal authority. So these political frustrations resonated among the members of the local community, in particular those loyal to Abdul Hamid in their view, still the Caliph of the Muslims. While making sure to stress loyalty for Romania and its king, in letters addressed to the Sultan, these Muslims called the Young Turks wicked, distancing themselves from all their achievements in Romania. These were certainly not the Muslims active in these reading rooms, the Qurat Names established by young Turks, separately for men and women across the Dobruja region where people would, would have a public space to read newspapers, journals, and discuss books aloud and debate the remedy to how to remedy the problem of illiteracy among both men and women. I couldn't find an old picture of these institutions, only Leila did for Boston Muslims, uh, but I did bring for uh, your entertainment a current picture of the reading rooms as envisioned by Turkish President Erdogan as site of lecture, tea or coffee drinking, and chatting about Islam in today's Turkey. The picture informs us here that the Kurat Names are not casinos, they're reading places. Anyway, in the 19th century, these reading rooms also opened in um, Sarajevo, Ruse, Vidin, Schumann, Varna, Samarkand, Tashkent, so all across the Islamic world, promoted as um, Leila Amzi Erdodular communication and unity through print in Muslim societies that possessed an established oral tradition. And based on this notion of uniting Muslims around their culture and heritage, intellectuals worked on expanding opportunities for cultural associations by founding societies that promoted modern values uh, among uh, Romanian Muslims. And um, this is the, the first association that was founded in the region, Association for the Spread of Education, Dobruja Tamini Marif Cemieti, uh, established in 1909. One of the most practical issues um, uh, that, uh, and, uh, that the Young Turks undertook was that of assisting the nearly 90,000 migrant uh, Muslim emigres or migrants to recover the properties left behind in uh, Dobruja in 1878. Uh, and uh, it was just a stroke of luck that I have discovered in the Ottoman archives in Istanbul about 3,000 files of this uh, kind on which I'm working right now for, for an article of, of this uh, unbelievable treasure uh, in Ottoman archives uh, that uh, assembled all the petitions uh, sent or sub submitted by um, Dobrujan Muslims to the Muharijin Commission, the, um, the committee that took uh, care of their uh, lands trying to recover them uh, from, from the Romanian state. So I have discovered this, uh, which is a stroke of luck since 150 million uh, documents from the broader Ottoman uh, world were found there. Um, and these, uh, actually another astonishing find at this level was that I found Temo's signature 
present on many of the files I have consulted there. And from reading the documents, I have learned something that was not mentioned in studies dedicated to him, or at least I didn't read those studies, that Temo functioned as a member of this committee, one that went so far as to hire skilled lawyers with Young Turk sympathies, of course, to help the emigrants, uh, the migrants recover their properties, properties in the region and was extremely successful in doing that. Um, the situation of the Rujas Muslim community was one of the thorniest issues in Ottoman Romanian relations um, after 1878. Um, and in April 1897, a Romanian delegation invited to see Sultan Abdul Hamid informed him of the willingness of Romanian authorities to improve the situation of these Muslims to give them the properties back if um, the Sultan would help the cause of the Vlach community, our Romanian community that lived in the Ottoman Empire. An Ottoman Christian group that was living scattered uh, among the largest groups of uh, much larger group of ethnic Turks, Greeks, Serbians, um, Albanians and uh, Bulgarians. The Ottoman government had granted this community privilege, privileges since the 15th century, but the Romanians wanted them to be placed under the um, umbrella of their, their church, the Romanian church, and also to be given uh, political autonomy. The Vlachs spoke a Romanian dialect and despite their uh, residence in the Ottoman Empire, Romanian officials considered them part of the Romanian nation. So there is a lot of, of, of grief about this and a lot of correspondence, but to, to cut this short, um, Ibrahim Temo was essential in um, communicating the needs of the Macedonians, of the, these Vlachs to the Romanian government and also the needs of the Albanian community living in exile. Um, in Romania. And these were not necessarily um, nationalist needs that these communities had. They just wanted to have political autonomy to live peacefully under um, the, the frame, I mean, as part of the framework of the Ottoman Empire, but to have rights. So um, the Salt, Sultan Abdul Hamid was pushed in um, May 1905 to recognize the rights of the Vlachs in the Ottoman Empire and the free use of Romanian language in their schools. And as I said, Temo worked very hard um, for such a recognition, never forgetting that he escaped the clutches of the Sultan with their help. It was the Vlachs who actually arranged for a trip for them from Istanbul to the Black Sea, who found a place of, of hiding on the boat and who supported him once he uh, arrived in Romania. Um, so this is still a work in progress, but I'm looking now at all this documentation about the Vlachs and the Albanian and their activities, their connections with Temo, because historical evidence suggests that all these Ottoman political emigres worked with each other to oppose the Sultan in Istanbul and develop their historical heritage. Um, as historian Issa Blumi argues, by looking at task Albanian social clubs and pub, uh, publication activity before 1908, when the Sultan was deposed by the Young Turks, these exiles supported the, you, you come to the conclusion that they supported the Young Turks and only afterwards they advocated for regional autonomy under a strengthened uh, Ottoman empire. Uh, so they preferred living under a peaceful imperial rule uh, rather than in a violent fractioned uh, or fractured home state. Uh, so Temo's role in these affairs illustrated the example of an individual who navigated effectively the conditions offered by Romania's rule um, as an Ottoman um, proximate locale, but this is still work in progress. So I would deeply appreciate your feedback and and help with this leg of the argument. In sum, um, this paper has focused on the impact of Crimean Jadidis and Young Turks on Romanian Muslims in the ways in which this interaction shaped Muslim identity in 19th century. 
the representatives of these two transnational networks served as community leaders, guides, uh, luminaries, causing the rise in the level of cultural and political engagement of local Muslims with the outside world. They founded the first Muslim press and cultural associations, as well as helped to educate the future Muslim elites of the region. Actually, the young Turks were the ones that constructed an amazing network of schools and associations, and through them um, brought this cultural development within the broader uh, community of local Muslims. The ability of these networks, I argue, to foster uh, cross-border uh, connections by ensuring the free movement of ideas and individuals across national frontiers contributed to the intellectual development and modernization of the entire community. And this is not the only case. Um, uh, also, uh, Bulgarian Muslims uh, felt this influence, uh, Bosnian Muslims felt uh, this influence. Uh, for someone like Ibrahim Temo, Dobruja became something of a privileged site, uh, enabling him to do things that he could not have done in the Ottoman Empire and even produce an impact there, as well as in Romania. Furthermore, historical evidence suggests that during this period, the Muslims became active agents rather than passive targets of state policies, becoming involved in all these activities, cultural, political, and developing a cross-regional modernity rooted in the Ottoman and Muslim thought um, to negotiate a place in Romanian and Islamic world. Their identity as a community was thus rationalized with references to, uh, to is the Islamic religion and intellectual heritage of the Bulgarian Muslims, as well as to their loyalty to Romania and its king. It could have been another way since Islam had been uh, included uh, in Romanian structure once Romania took over uh, this uh, particular uh, region. Uh, the larger significance of this research thus is the appreciation of the role that outside forces have on the construction of group identities in borderland areas during the empire to nation transition. This approach best enables us to capture the dynamic interaction between state, local actors and transnational forces in the forging of modern collective identities. And this is an approach which has limits because we see this history is, is given, given to us by documents produced by the elites um, and uh, in different contexts. But this pushes us to think far more dynamically of different trajectories to the process of identity formation in such borderland areas like Dobruja in the context of Ottoman, Islamic, European and world history. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share my work with you. And now I'm open to a discussion and I hope I didn't take a lot of your time. Oh, no. Thank you very much. It was so uh, fantastic. And um, Thank you. as you were delivering, I think there was a lively sort of um, uh, <laughs> back and forth in the, in the chat, especially about the visuals and the maps and some amazing pictures that you have provided. Uh, and I know that this uh, really makes uh, uh, your presentation really animated uh, because uh, certain you know photos just bring to life you know some of the some of the archival work that you've done. Yeah. Um, Dr. Neuberger. Well, as much as I'd like to continue staring at that map, I was going to suggest you stop share for our conversation. <laughs> Oh, okay. though I love that map and Steven Siegel who just entered you missed a lot of good maps today I have to tell you <laughs> but um this is why I love Balkan history this was such a rich talk and um it's so fascinating to think about how these transnational flows of people and ideas were going on in this this very dynamic period um and I mean, not only was there a sort of unmixing of populations based on ethnicity after the carving out of independent states, there was also still many people left behind on either side of the border or even who moved to various sides of the border based on political orientation. So um, that thinking of those migrations, not just about ethnicity, but also about political orientation, often the Balkans, the new Balkan states created a kind of a shelter 
for some of these Muslim, you know, uh, these groups such as the Young Turks from the Ottomans um, themselves, but how that also put these new Balkan states into a sticky situation because they, <laughs> they still had Ottoman relations to keep up, trade relations and, and other kinds of things that made it really, and actually, you know, Bulgaria still technically was in the Ottoman Empire till 1908. Um, so all of that complexity is just, you get, you get at it so well. And I think this is kind of a long time coming, this kind of rich work um, in which we kind of see the complexity. And I think using Dobruja as a focus to kind of pull that all that together is, is really helpful um, because, you know, it's happening in, in different regions in different ways. Um, and so I have actually so many questions but uh, I'm trying to think of which ones to even which one to even focus on first. But um, I guess I was interested in just kind of based on my own research on this property issue. You talked about people returning to reclaim properties. Yes. Um, but what about um, like Vakuf properties um, that were left behind? And how did those play into, I think you talked a little bit about, and I want you to expand a little bit on the tension between the kind of young Turk, Turk groups or influence group or Jadide, Jadide influence groups and the kind of, I suppose, old Turks, you could call them, <laughs> or the more conservative Muslims. And I'm wondering if that tension manifested in struggles over those properties, those fund, which provided funding for schools and also the shape of what these schools would be, like how conservative the schools would be. Mm -hmm. Excellent question. Thank you so much. In terms of Vakuf properties, um, after 1878, uh, the Romanian government decided to confiscate all of those. And there has been a, uh, a uh, law that was issued by the government in 1882 uh, and another one in 1880 clarifying the status of the region, but the one in 1882 really raised the issue of properties. And the um, condition was for the migrants to return in a particular time frame, uh, but the communication of the needs of the Romanian uh, government was not necessarily the most fortunate one. They didn't make a huge efforts to advertise uh, these, these efforts and really tell those, those Muslims, be they Tatar or Turk, uh, to come back and claim their properties. Those who did, and as I said, I found these um, three, about 3,000, not documents, files that contained all these requests of uh, the Muslim, the Brujan Muslims in diaspora now in the Ottoman Empire who are coming from all sorts of corners of the Ottoman Empire to Istanbul to submit their applications, um, were confronted and stunned by the unwillingness of the Romanian authorities represented in, uh, in this uh, com uh, commission of verifying the titles in acknowledging the, 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 the tapu titles, the deed titles. Because um, Dobruja, and I didn't say that, but Dobruja had been actually a, a victim of four different Russo-Ottoman wars in the 19th century and gravely uh, affected by the Crimean War. So many of these populations I talked about and all the other ethnic groups had been dislocated during this time. Their properties were burned. Their things were burned. Their deeds were burned. These people did not get to them necessarily. And plus there's another aspect of this property issue. Not all of these uh, former Ottoman subjects had property deeds because they would inherit these properties, although the, the, the land, of course, belonged to, to the Ottoman um, uh, Sultan, but except for <laughs> specific properties, but um, they would inherit the usufruct, so the, the right of using that verbally. <laughs> so it was an understanding between them and the neighbors uh, around their property that that would be theirs to administer for as long as the head of the household lived. So um, all these migrants were encouraged to go and uh, have new deeds issued. And many of them went uh, to the um, uh, Ministry of the, the Property Deeds in Istanbul and received such 
new, um, like copies of their deeds, but still the Romanian government would not acknowledge them, would consider them uh, fraudulent. And this, this is not an issue that is common only to Romanian Muslims. This unfortunately happened all over the Islamic world that fell under the rule of Christian uh, governments. And especially in the Balkans, uh, this, they, they used the property issue to get rid of all the, those unwanted elements because Romania was engaged very much into uh, um, nationalism and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and its own confused identity at the time, which I actually had uh, commented on when Kit had his presentation. Um, uh, you know, determined Romanian authorities to be uh, scattered about what they really, what's their vision of the future nation, Romanian nation. They knew they didn't want the Muslims, that's for sure. Um, they weren't as- Instrumentalized, yeah, um, yeah they, political they, instrument. Absolutely, they weren't as bitter as the Bulgarians were in the, 19, in the early 20th century and at the end of the 19th, but still, they were an un unwanted uh, population. In terms of the tensions between old Turks and young Turks, according to the documents that I have read, that was not, the property issue was not a, an issue that really concerned them, not even the education. The modern education, of course, they were extremely disappointed that uh, Islam did not um, have the dominant role in, in, in the educational system as it had prior to uh, Tanzimat schools, prior to all those Rushdie schools or the modern schools that came with a Western inspired um, uh, curriculum. But they focused on um, bitterly on all these appointments of uh, imams who would be appointed by the Babu Meshihat in, in Istanbul, the, the seat of the Sheikh al-Islam. Um, they were all foreigners and there was bitter competition between different factions of the Muslim community, the old and the new, um, because the new faction, the young, inspired by the young Turks, wanted pliable imams um, who would you know, approve their political agenda, but also would work very much to, to transform the thinking of the Dobrogen Muslims, especially the youth, um, and um, awaken them culturally. Uh, so that was really a bitter uh, tension between them. To this tension, the Romanian <laughs> Romanian Ottoman re, uh, of relations um, uh, brought another aspect of this discussion because Romanians wanted pliable imams who were born in the Dobruja, who knew Romanian, who were from there, and that's why they supported the Muslim Madrasa in Mejidie, uh, moved from Baba Dao, and, and this was a uh, uh, Madrasa that was part of a Vakf or a Wakf that was formed back in the 17th century, which was confiscated by the Romanian government in 1878. But they fully supported this madrasa, which um, had the role to uh, train, to instruct the imams and the hojas of the Muslim community for the purpose of having them appointed eventually to these positions. So it is, this is the most interesting thing that I have noticed that the issue of the imam was, war, was uh, important. Uh, voting was important in the community for particular issues um, related to Romanian Ottoman relations. And the old Turkish establishment was for Abdul Hamid. They couldn't go past their loyalties for the caliph. And, and they said that in their petition. Uh, we, we do appreciate the fact that Romania is, you know, now um, leading, uh, ruling over us, but uh, we have remained staunch uh, uh, supporters of Abdul Hamid. But this old faction lost in the long run because the young Turks had such a fundamental uh, um, uh, influence on um, the Muslim youth that gradually you see a process of secularization and modernization uh, taking over this Muslim community as we go forward 
um, in the 20th century. So, and then you have uh, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk with his Kemalism catching very much, uh, I mean, being extremely popular in the Dobruja region, uh, like the Young Turks were in the 19th century. Thank you so much for that great answer to my numerous questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Keith Wagner, we'd like to hear your question. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Catalina. I'm really looking forward to um, reading your work about this. Um, so my question, I guess, is less specifically about Dobruja and um, more about um, the, the poles of influence, um, since you talked about um, Muslims trying to cultivate these ideals of modernity. Um, and um, at one point, people being based in Paris and sort of that being like a location of their think tank. So um, this tension of between Paris and Istanbul as um, the poles of influence, um, I'm wondering if you can talk about that because it seems like almost the late Ottoman Tanzimat era um, civil servants wanted to train in Paris, um, but then bring that back. So like, did they, did they want influence from the West, but then reversioned in a, in a Ottoman way, or was it important to have both or um, yeah, uh, if you can comment on that at all. Of course, to the best of my ability, this is uh, Shukru Haniolo's work <laughs> and he should comment on this, uh, especially he, he did uh, uh, tremendous work on the Young Turks in all their uh, stages of evolution. Uh, but to the best of my ability, of course, that the Young Turks were modernizing elites. They were trained um, abroad. Uh, they were uh, also uh, products of all those modern Ottoman schools of the Tanzimat period, which employed um, a lot of methodology and also curriculum from the West. Um, and these were the, the people who were very progressive, who wanted the constitution, who wanted a government that represented them, uh, who wanted more voting rights, more input um, in the public sphere, more agency in, in, in public life. But um, once um, Abdul Hamid II uh, accepted uh, the invitation of the Ottoman elites to become a sultan, on the condition that he would approve a constitution and that he would um, uh, be uh, there to support representative government in the Ottoman Empire, uh, these elites really trusted his his uh, his word and um, and appointed him. I mean, appointed supported his appointment after the the failure with the, with his predecessor. Um, but he immediately turned around. Uh, and um, and and backed up from all his promises, and it was in this extremely tense, convoluted, um, and disappointing context that the Young Turks, um, so all the representatives of the Young Turks, uh, because this organization was organized later in the 1880s in reaction to what Abdul Hamid II uh, uh, did, and from within this Ottoman bureaucracy and intelligentsia that was trained abroad and in Tanzimat schools. So of course that they mobilized themselves. So they chose uh, sites like Paris, Geneva, uh, Constanza, Bucharest, um, uh, Ruse, Plovdiv, other uh, uh, um, uh, important cities um, and Cairo. Uh, so they created this amazing network um, that was actually working quite effectively in the beginning. And the most important work they were doing was to publish, to publish, publish, publish journals, brochures, um, propaganda materials, um, telling the world like, for instance, I'm just making this silly comparison like Ukraine tells us about and we know about the Russian propaganda, right? So telling everyone that the Sultan's propaganda is just distorting Ottoman realities and uh, that actually he didn't keep his promise and um, we should have a better Ottoman empire uh, as, a, as a geopolitical factor in European and world affairs. Um, so they published a lot, and because of that, because the way of the way in which they depicted the Sultan as a cruel um, <laughs> vampire sucking on the blood of its subjects and all that, 
um, and condemned his actions and his autocratic policies. Um, he, uh, they actually were united by a common goal. But according to Shukri Hadiyalu's work and to the documents I read and I consulted in this collection uh, belonging to Temo, which is currently split between Romania and uh, Albania, actually what you have at work here is a change um, within the organization. Uh, which was uh, gradually, you know, uh, being placed under different leaders uh, with the, uh, who had different agendas, different priorities, and more and more of a radicalizing or radicalization you see uh, growing from within them. So Tamo's position in this, since he was one of the founders of the Committee for Pro Union and Progress, CPU, um, is telling in uh, looking at the trajectory of the Young Turk movement. Uh, he was all for it, he supported it, he did exactly the publishing work that Paris was doing, Geneva was doing, Cairo was doing, in Bucharest, in Constanza, in other centers in the Balkans. Um, but um, once the Sultan was dethroned, he went back to the Ottoman Empire. He was invited there uh, to, to become part of, of uh, the Young Turk establishment. However, he disliked the radicalism that characterized that establishment and how now the Young Turks were no longer for necessarily cultural awakening of all the Muslims. So he had this universal vision mm -hmm. of, of uh, uh, you know, groups, different ethnic groups. He himself, he was an Albanian Turk, right? You know, he was he was not um, nationalistic in in the way in which um, young Turks have become. So young Turks gradually, after 1908, uh, became Turkified, or you know, I you know, uh, yeah, reverting to yeah, embracing that that brand of nationalism, which Temo resented um, as an Albanian and other members of this organization did because they were not all Turks. They were not all ethnic Turks. They were Albanians, they were Arabs, they were, uh, you know, Romanians, they were whatever. Um, and they were not, they were not for, for this brand of nationalism, which will in the long run, you know, cause all the atrocities that are collectively known as the genocide of, of the Armenian community. So you see the radicalization of this and Temo resented it, left Istanbul, came back to Dobruja and continued his activity, became a member in the Romanian parliament and, and died in, in Romania and is buried there. Uh, so yeah, he is, uh, He's an example of, of looking at much larger processes at work in the greater Ottoman, but not only Ottoman Islamic world that was changing in so many ways that is, is sometimes overwhelming for the scholar <laughs> to describe with, uh, with accuracy. <laughs> and Thank you, Catalina. <clears throat> and I'm violence. sorry to uh, interject. It, it is because we do have two other questions and we're running a little bit short on time. Uh, okay. One of them is uh, if you would like to uh, address a question by our colleague, Stephen Siegel. Uh, Stephen, floor is yours. It's his boring question. You have to. Boring question. <laughs> It, it, is, it is a question as a, an admirer of your work, Catalina, back 10 years. Um, and I, I really um, am grateful for the work that you've done on from 1878 to 1913. I, I read that um, in your use of seeing like a state and James Scott. I remember reading this when I was writing my book. So I, I was sorry to miss your earlier interventions with maps. I'll, I'll definitely watch the YouTube video for this. I had a really quick question about your conceptions of, of land and land tenure and some of the, I guess I would call legislative legacies of the Ottoman um, state in that top-down manner. Could you, could you say a little bit about how this affects farming classes? And, and what I mean is um, here I'm thinking about you know, not just like say Romanians who were part of the Romanianization of Dobruja, but like Italians who were um, invited to come in in the 1880s. Um, do you see this kind of nation state legacy affecting the, the Turkification projects as, as well? And, and I guess 
in many ways, like how so? Because for farmers, the infrastructure is so very important when you're building the bridges like the 1895 bridge or you know, thinking about ways that they can just simply make a living and, and survive the taxation yes. system. That, that's really my question here as a kind of geographer. So I hope yeah, it's not too boring. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. This is a, a fantastic question that deserves a book to be written. And a book that actually uh, doesn't focus only on Dobrujan Muslims who are greatly affected by the change in legislation, change in regime, and especially by land, uh, land uh, legislation. Um, and uh, it's a complex issue that, that pushed them away. Um, once the Romanian government took over, um, and they were um, all the Muslims and non-Muslim population of Dobruja were obliged to show their property deeds. Uh, those mostly were not considered valid. And this triggered their migration to the Ottoman Empire and other Balkan territories. Um, but another part of this is that those who could prove their land ownership were asked to pay such exorbitant notary mm. fees to have them recognized and integrated into the Romanian system. And um, so, so many of them were also affected by the huge fees that they had to pay, uh, installments that they have to pay throughout uh, years to, to own that land. So there is an issue of ownership here. And the Romanians, like all the other nation states, savvily or in a savvy way, uh, played played this issue and used it to nationalize their territory. And this is a frontier, a, a borderland region of enormous strategic importance. One that Romania did not want uh, in Berlin, one that Romania rejected in Berlin and because they wanted southern Basarabia, which they lost to, to the Russians. Um, but once they, they were confronted with all these great, mosaic of people, that's how it's described in contemporary accounts uh, by, by people, by scholars, um, they had to deal with this issue. And the fact that the Ottomans did not have the same type of land ownership as the Romanians had in their old kingdom, uh, meaning proper ownership of their uh, not only houses and gardens, uh, vegetable gardens, but also land, hectares, acres, whatever, um, that really uh, confused um, the Muslims and non-Muslims and this triggered I, that. I, uh, I guess- that. But, it, but in, also yeah. once, once they left or once they, um, they did not come back, this region, which has a fantastic agricultural potential, because it was a basket for the Ottoman Empire after, after uh, yeah, yes, Egypt. Yes, yes. So, so um, what do you do as a Romanian government? So putting yourself in their shoes too. Uh, they have this very complicated region with so many ethnic groups um, emptied by migration, affected greatly by wars. What do you do uh, to, uh, to settle the land issue and such. So not only they used na nationalization, but they had to use, um, you know, colonization policies to bring in people, but they chose to bring only ethnic Romanians, right? From Transylvania, from Wallachia, from Moldavia, those who were willing to come and they were fully supported. Uh, by the Romanian government, which did not bother to support fully the indigenous Muslim population that was, um, you know, abused in multiple ways. And we have a fantastic minister of internal affairs and foreign affairs, Mihail Kogelnicanu, whose son, Vasile Kogelnicanu, sponsors Young Turk publications and, and fight again, fighting against Abdul Hamid II, um, who, decries this situation. He does not understand why Romania has to behave in this way. And the king also, if you read his memoirs, the king wanted to abdicate a thousand times, uh, dismayed by, by the low quality of the political um, environment and the politicians who were bickering against each other, didn't have a vision of the country. And so we get to Keith's presentation. They were confused about their identity as a nation as well. 
Um, so it was very, very complicated. But yes, so Romania, Thank you. Like, yeah. like all the other countries, they they embraced nationalism and perhaps not the the happiest side of nationalism, the, the most destructive one, unfortunately. Thank, thanks. I, I, re I really look forward to reading more. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Catalina. And I'm sorry, I don't want to be rude that I'm interjecting or so on, but there are so many questions of this rich multi-layered presentation. And I want to address, especially the ones um, you know that are put, posted in the chat as well. Uh, so there is a question from Itak Europe too, uh, who says, "Thank you for the interesting presentation. In your uh, slide number sixteen, you mentioned that uh, the President Erdogan could not understand the connection of this with Kumarne Kiertane context in relation with your topic, casinos and cafes. So could you please explain it on this slide again?" I, <laughs> yes, I apologize to I touch for this. Um, it was just a bad joke. I mean, I could not find a superb picture as the one that Leila introduced in her work of these amazing uh, reading rooms, Grad Hanes in, um, in uh, Bosnia. And I just, you know, I apologize. I, I had to use something just to lighten up the audience, but um, what is interesting about President Erdogan is that he recreated one of the most e um, exciting and innovative um, uh, aspects of, um, of Ottoman modernization, the reading groups, which, you know, showed up uh, during the late stage of the Tanzimat, um, or the second stage of the Tanzimat period and represented a staple institution that introduced people to the new modernizing reforms of the empire. And so I think, um, I don't know, I'm not a specialist uh, in, in um, contemporary Turkish politics or uh, Erdogan as much as I want, I would love to, to be. Um, I um, I think he claims legacy, right? <laughs> Ottoman legacy, he, he does claim that, um, element um, that was so popular and so, um, um, you know, extremely uh, cherished in modernizing centers. And he opposes that with, of course, as the, the Islamic inclined as he is or he claims to be, opposes that to the ugly side of modernization, casinos and stuff like that. That's that's how I can interpret that. And um, if I touch wants to talk to me about this and, and give me his uh, uh, 10 cents, I welcome that because I would like to learn more about that. Uh, but it's so, <laughs> it's so interesting that still, you know, Tanzima reformist policies, some of the it's more it, most exciting things are reinterpreted today by someone like Erdogan, a very well known, um, uh, you know, Islamist or how do you call it? like somebody who's uh, more conservative um, and uh, appreciates the role of Islam in society Catalina, in different ways. I think I think Aitaj says, yes, uh, thank you. I agree with you. And uh, he clearly understands the joke. So just to make it <laughs> thank uh, you. sure. Uh, so we do have uh, room for one more um, participant that was raising hand. And this is uh, Christiane. Uh, Christiane, uh, would you like to ask your question? And then, of course, you know, uh, if time is left, okay, you know, well, I promise to give yeah, a yeah. second chance. So. Don't worry. Don't, I, will miss, I will miss my question. Uh, so I just um, I want to know that it's very, very difficult to work with such kind of Ottoman records, specifically from that region because of the mixed population. So the Katerina should, should, uh, should read and understand a lot of different and at least a lot of different names from Islamic origin, from Turk origin, from Bulgarian mm -hmm. origin names, mm -hmm. from Tatar <laughs> origin yeah. names, Romanian origin names. So it's very, very difficult. So because of that, at least because of that, congratulations uh, uh, for your works. It, uh, it was a very, very, very interesting talk for, uh, talk for me. Unfortunately, we are in the run of time, so I should be... Uh, very brief, but uh, congratulations once again. Thank you so much. And this really uh, pushes me to finish this book manuscript, get it done, 
as soon as possible so I can make public all this work and also uh, the place this work you know, in the context of the some of the most exciting, fantastic work that is occurring at this time. Um, and I have mentioned just three of the scholars that I deeply admire, Isa Blumi and Leila Amzi, Erdodular and uh, Milena Metodieva doing fantastic work on the Balkans and, and placing their work in a global historical context, which we really need to talk about and, and make um, as our own historians uh, an appeal to comparative uh, history yeah, and yeah, yeah, much yeah. global vision, yes. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Thank you so much as well. I guess with that, we will be closing the Balkan Circle for today. Thank you for this wonderful talk. And um, we're really excited about your book. So please let us know when it's out <laughs> so we can widely advertise and circulate and read it and assign it to our students. <laughs> Thank you so um, much. It, it's been wonderful to, to be here. And I, I greatly admire your lecture series. And I consider this a great honor and pleasure. Um, to, to be here with all of you. And I'm eager to listen to, uh, to the future uh, lectures as well. Thank you. Well, much. I'm astounded by the richness of your research um, and your presentation was awesome. So thank you again. Thank you. And we'll have to give you a round of applause. Thank, thank you. You, too, to you too. You are thank you. Thank you. Uh, it is a real <laughs> pleasure. The, the Fridays are just full of pleasure um and um and i'm so glad actually thank you for the kind assessment uh it's a rare opportunity to have uh this deep and important conversation on the balkans and just look at this intersectionality because uh frankly again this just reiterates my topic you know that not that we're the most special but we can provide you know a lot of insights you know with our regional interests you know uh historical political social um, um, and even economic uh, lessons and all that, all the way to archaeology, uh, which are applicable outside uh, of, of this context. So Catalina has been a real, real pleasure. Thank you.